Hospital Porter's pride and dignity stop the New World Order. Welcome to Her Panwo TV. Today is Saturday the 19th of October 2013 and um, those of you who have followed my work closely may remember what I did a, a year ago today on the 19th of October 2012. Something rather amazing happened. It all began with me uploading a private video which I sent to a few of you not to everyone at first. I made it public eventually, but I started off by making it private. I'll just play that now. Don't be alarmed. Okay, this was last year. Hospital Porter's pride and dignity stop the New World Order. Welcome to Her Panwo TV. If you're watching this, it means that you are one of the individuals that I consider trustworthy enough to deal with the information I'm about to give you responsibly. This is a private video, it doesn't appear in any listings, it doesn't appear in any searches. It is one that I've shared with you and with a handful of other people and not anyone else. Okay, um, the reason I'm doing this is because tomorrow evening, that's Friday the 19th, I'm going to do something which could get me into a lot of trouble. Now, I'm not going to, I'm not going to get all Hollywood, I'm not going to do any sort of Hollywood sort of macho stuff, alright, but, um, you know, I'm not going to start saying to you, if I don't come back, please tell my mum and dad that I love them, or anything like that, okay, it's not that serious, okay, but there is some risk involved with what I'm about to attempt, and that is a fact, and I have to take precautions based on that fact. I can't give you too much details right now, okay, but what I'm, what I'm going to do... Tomorrow evening, I'm going to go somewhere where I have good reason to believe some form of occult or supernatural activity will take place. I'm going to investigate, I'm going to try and film if I can. Now, what, what like I'm saying, alright... When I come back, when I come home tomorrow evening, or the latest Saturday morning, I will upload the films I make, or I will make another film explaining what happened. Um, if I don't do that, I want you to give me until Saturday evening. If nothing appears between Saturday evening, or you haven't heard from me, I want you to download this video and upload it to your own channel. All right, because it means something has happened to me, which has prevented me from getting in contact with any of you or for uploading any more videos. As I'm saying, this is unlikely it's going to be in trouble it's, uh, to the extent that I'm not able to do that, but I just need to... I just need to, to be aware that it's something that I have to make contingency plans for the possibility of. Okay? And I've also got to ask you to keep this information confidential. And don't tell anyone else that you've received this video from me. If anyone else asks you about it, then just tell them you don't know. For those of you who have not received this video, I'm very, very sorry, because I may well make this video public if all goes well. Okay. For those of you who have not received this video, I'm sorry, I couldn't just, I just had to select a certain number of people, a small number of people. It was a difficult decision to make who I could share this with, this information with. Okay, too many people, it might have blown my, sort of, um, the secrecy of what's involved. Thank you very much. Hospital Porter's pride and dignity stop the New World Order. Now, as you can see, nothing happened to me uh, because I was able to upload all the other videos and I began with an introduction which I will be playing for you now. Hospital Porter's pride and dignity stop the New World Order. Welcome to her Panwo TV. Right, it's about 7pm. Friday, Friday the 19th of October 2012 and um, I'm feeling a little bit nervous right now. Um, some of you were sent a private video which gave you a little bit of background of what I'm doing now. That is just that um, I'm about to do something a bit risky and that if something went wrong which meant I couldn't get back then I was going to ask you to upload the video and just spread the word and tell them that I, something had happened to stop me getting back. 
And as I said in the private video, I don't want to sound all melodramatic and Hollywood and stuff like that, you know, but, um, you know, I have to take precautions because there's some, there is an element of, there's a perilous element to what I'm about to do. Thing is, if you're watching this, it means I've got back all right and I'm fine. And I'm, I'm uploading the videos that I made uh, yesterday evening, or this evening, rather. Now, uh, today, for Friday the 19th of October, is actually St. Fried Wide's Day. And that is what's interesting, and that is why I'm doing what I'm doing tonight. Um, the place I'm going tonight, I can tell you now, those of you that watched the private video will be wondering, I can tell you. It's actually a place I filmed that before. Do you remember my video about Port Meadow and Binsey and the church? It's actually St. Margaret's Church. The thing about St. Margaret's Church, if you remember, is there's that well in the middle of the graveyard. And you can see it on the film. It's actually a sacred well. It's a holy well dedicated to St. Frideswide. St. Frideswide is the patron saint of Oxford and Oxford University. Now, um, if you remember from that film, the church is very, very remote. It's in, in a little forested glade in the village of Binsey. And Binsey itself is an isolated, very, very archaic village. I mean, if you, you saw what it was like, it's like going back in time 300 years, just stepping into it. Yet it's about, it's only an hour's walk from Oxford city centre, and it's within the city limits of Oxford. Very, very strange place. Anyway, the church, if you remember, was very, very old. It's got no electricity, no running water. It's not changed at all since, since it was built in the 12th century. Um, and um, the, the well is known as, it's called St. Frideswide's Well, and it is dedicated to St. Frideswide. And it's, the mo it's what inspired Lewis Carroll when he wrote Alice's, Advent Alice's Adventures in Wonderland to, 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 to bring, put into the story the treacle well. I mean, the treacle in the book symbolises um, the curative powers of the water, because it's said that it is, has curative powers. My friend Ellis Taylor, who I'd like to thank for all the help he's given me in this venture, wrote an article about this on his website, which you can see. It's, um, it's all about that particular... It's all about that area and what happened to him there, which is basically what's what set me off on this quest. Um, what happened was, you see, a friend, um, a friend of his told him that he was reading a book by Andrew Collins called The 21st Century Grail. I mean, you'll remember Andrew Collins from the Glastonbury film I did. But he also wrote a book, he also writes about other subjects apart from ancient Egypt. And, and what happened was Andrew went to St. Margaret's Church in Binsey on St. Frideswide night. And just before midnight, he saw um, 12 hooded figures moving through the churchyard in procession, chanting in Latin like monks. Um, Collins, you know, and Andrew Collins was very frightened and he buggered off, you know, as, as people would be. Now, Ellis decided to go back there on, on St. Frideswide's Day, that is the 19th of October, with another cut two friends, and decided to have a look for himself. Um, anyway, they, was, they hid in the churchyard in some bushes, and they saw some misty shapes rising up from the graves, and then they started seeing cloaked figures dash around in the graveyard. Um, it was very, very strange. I mean, they, they, they heard the incantations too, and there was lo the candle lights flickering in the church. Um, oh, it's like a... But then they sort of disappeared. Now, Ellis is not sure whether they... Well, he was wanting... There is a supernatural element to this in terms of the figures coming out of the graves, but... There could be a human element too, there could be people involved in some kind of ritual. If there is, then um, it's, very, it's, it's very, very sinister. Uh, but basically I've decided to go to Binsey myself, to St. Margaret's Church, tonight, St. Fry's Wise Night, and see what happens. And 
there is something. Obviously, we're going to have to be careful. This, there, as I said, this we're going in. We're going to observe, or try to observe, supernatural activity, or even an occult ritual. And this is why I'm dressed up like an SAS assassin. <laughs> With this stuff. I mean, I, I went. I tried to find that black makeup paint I used for my Obama video about disclosure, but I can't find it. Fine. So this is just felted paint. I'll just rub it in a little bit later, trying to cover my face. It doesn't have to be complete. It just stops me from reflecting the light. Um, just makes me, you know, makes me uh, better camouflage in the darkness. So we're going to try and find a hiding place, and we're going to observe what happens in the church. I'm not going to go into the church like Ellis did. I'm going to try and find a place outside it. Um, I'm not going alone. Um, one of El a mutual friend of Ellis and mine, he's coming with me. Um, I didn't really want to go on the own, and Ellis luckily <laughs> found me some, found me someone willing to accompany me. Um, I'm in Fry's White, in Frithaswith, as she's sometimes called. Now, um, she was an English princess, and she was the son of King Dida of Ensham. Um, and she was born in about six, the year 650, and the world was very different in those days, or England was very different, Britain. England especially, was totally, it was a totally different place, because this was the Anglo-Saxon era, and I'm sort of toying with the idea at the moment that the Anglo-Saxon era was actually a pre-Illuminati time for England, um, I'm not sure. But, um, Fry's wife, she became a nun, and she, uh, founded a priory in Oxford and she uh, had to escape several times because uh, King Olgar of Mercia wanted to marry her and um, she's um, described as doing various miracle miraculous things like creating, creating springs out of the water, rather like um, St Bernadette did in Lourdes in 1850 and the, the church and the well, the well there is supposed to be one of the ones she created. Right, well, um, remains to be seen what happens this evening. Obviously, if you're watching this, it means everything went fine. I came home and I've uploaded whatever I've recorded. Now, maybe something we will see something significant, which in which case I hope I'll be able to film it. I have a night shot capability on my camera, but it's it's not very sophisticated. It's nothing like the things Wing Keach uses. You know, they remember him from Amash, the Amash conference. Um, it's just a simple thing. But at least I'll be there, I'll give you a commentary, I'll try and pick up any sound I hear. I'm taking a backup, my mobile phone is a backup camera, and a voice recorder too. And, um... Well, I mean, watch the film, watch the film in the description box, which is the film I took in Port Meadow, and, and the Binzi in the village and church, which will give you some background, or show you where we are, because I filmed that in daylight. I'm going to be there at night time. And, um... Just wish me luck, eh? Thanks for watching Hapanmo TV. Hospital Porters Pride and Dignity Stop the New World Order. Well, those videos will give you a little bit of an introduction into what I'm doing this year. <coughs> and, um, um, of course, uh, I'm basically doing the same thing this year as I was doing last year. Although, of course, this year I'm a lot more easy going about it. I'm not as worried as I was last year. No need for any private videos. No need for any uh, special forces posers, camouflage. No, I'm just going to go as I am because I'm not worried. I don't think any people are involved in the ritual that I'm going to be attending. Um, it's, probably, it's a purely supernatural event, in which case a bit of boot polish on my face and a woolly hat won't put them off. Um, that being said, however, I'm, it's still at the back of my mind that some people might sort of come along to this. Some people might be end up being involved partly because well obviously some people who saw my video last year might get the idea of trying it themselves although they haven't contacted me if they have done I mean if they wanted to come along they could have come with me you see they could have contacted me and we could have gone together as a group um, as it happens I'm going with somebody else this this um, this year a close friend of mine not Jeff who went with me last year but somebody else um, I'm not sure he wants to be named, I'll have to check with him whether he wants to be named and take part in this film. If he does, then that's all well and good. There is a, the reason I think it's at the back of my mind that there may be people involved this time is because this year, St. Friday's Day, forms, falls on a Saturday. 
and the reason why I think that's significant I will explain in due course but before I do that let's just have a little reminder of what happened last year the, the principal reason I want to go again this year is because of what happened last year I'll now just play that little bit of video what's the time now uh, Jeff? I'll tell you what, if you can, mate, um, that'd be brilliant. I can show the Herpanmo TV viewers your photos, you know. The moment. Everything looks completely normal, literally yeah. nothing has happened. I, I feel like Chris French. Well, I didn't see anything and I <laughs> say there's no evidence. You know, all I, all I have to do is have this really smug kind of eyebrow, raise my eyebrows in this smug way and I just look just like Chris French. <laughs> NBA goal. NBA! NBA! <laughs> Here we go, I'll have another go. You can have another shot with the camera? Yeah, sure. Okay. Should we call it a night? Yeah. <clears throat> I just heard something. I just heard something in my ear. Heard, it's like a voice. Something up. I thought it was an insect, but it's a voice. Are you there? Come back. It was right by my ear, like someone whispering in my ear, or, or talks talking into my ear. Mm. Is anyone there? Huh? I'll wait and see if they, they might come back. You know what, Jeff? <clears throat> The, I heard that voice. Or, or, I mean, I'll play this back to find out. When I said call it a night, and you were just. That's when I heard the voice. Where well, am I snorting? Well, snows, was it? <laughs> but no, no, it wasn't. It was in this here, and it was, it was like someone standing on my shoulder or by my shoulder. Really? And I just heard. Well, I didn't even hear a word. It was just a. Uh, uh, uh. But it was very distinct. At first, I thought it was an insect buzzing past my ear, but no, it was a voice. It was a wo like a woman's voice, I think. Female? Yeah. Mm. Or a child's voice. Her Panmo TV viewers, it was the exact moment, just after I heard, I said, let's should we call it a night. Well, then where'd you go? <coughs> Maybe not. Yeah, we're going to go back. Okay, well, we're going to call it a night. No, the voice hasn't come back. Our uh, Panama TV viewers, um, we're going to just pack up our stuff and head back to the car. Anything more of interesting, anything else interesting happens, my cameras are in my pocket. I'll be quick on the draw. <laughs> Thanks. Hospital porters, pride and dignity, stop the new world order. And that was a very strange experience indeed. Um, as I explained that, <clears throat> and I'm glad I, ha I'm glad I had the camera on at the time so I could capture my initial reaction. Um, isn't, you know, I can't sort of just talk about it afterwards on camera and then um, wonder whether I, I imagined something or my memory wasn't serving me right, things like that. Um, no, no, I captured what, exactly when it happened on camera. Now, what I experienced was a noise in my ear, in my right ear. 
it was a noise that sounded at first I thought it was just an insect flying past my ear um, but it wasn't that was my first impression it's like when you you hear the sound outside you you think that's a thunderclap and then you it's just for a split second you think that's a thunderclap and then you realize it's the sound of a, a jet aircraft flying low over your house it was that kind of experience um so because the skeptics will say chris french will probably say well there's no evidence because you said it was an insect well maybe it was an insect no no chris it wasn't an insect mate um what it sounded to me was like it sounded like a voice it sounded like a human voice spoken quite quite loudly close to my ear and I don't did only hear I felt I actually felt on my skin around my ear and on my ear hole there I actually felt um, the movement of air as if as if I, they were close enough to my ear for me to feel the movement of air as they exhaled while speaking the voice was um, the voice was quite um, I suppose it was quite low. It was I don't know it's about low. It was um, no, it's quite a high voice. It's quite sort of like a, a high voice, like a, a woman or child's voice. I should say. I would say low, low in volume, not sort of moderate in volume, quite loud, like a child's voice. Um, and or maybe a woman's voice. It, some people said it might have been Alistair Crowley, and I'll explain the significance of Alistair Crowley in a minute, because he has quite. A, he has quite a sort of alto voice, if you listen to him. It's not a very deep voice. It's quite like a kind of um, alto tenor voice. There are a few recordings of Alistair Crowley's original, um, originally speaking. He, he made a few recordings while he was at his temple in Chefalu in the 1920s. He used a primi primitive wax cylinder um, device, which is not very, very good quality, but you can sh distinctly hear the man speaking. Um, and um, there's something a bit... Uh, well, I'll play you. I'll play you one of them, so you can see. I'll just give you. I'll just give you a taste of what it, what um, he actually sounds like. Oh, to me, my hey, town of the Lohas of the Inn. So, but I hear the known of paper, right, dear laddie. That's for Rebe, Obo, lay hey, dear, I sham. After them, oh. Now, that might have been the voice um, I heard. I'll take that off. <coughs> but I'm not completely sure. Um, it's possible that was it. If, if that's the case, well, it, it fits in with what I'm about to tell you about the background to this case. I mean, I'd love to be able to play you what I heard. I'd love to be able to say I recorded it so you could hear it. But, I mean, I've been through that video that I showed you of when I hear it, when I've got the camera on myself and I hear it. And I've, I've tried to... I've turned the volume up to full gain. I've run it, I've run it through my editor, through the movie maker, and I cannot hear a thing. Nothing appeared on the film soundtrack absolutely nothing i've um i heard it very very distinctly in my ear it was at a volume where it ought to have been picked up by the microphone actually but it wasn't nothing appeared on the film soundtrack at all very very strange indeed but it's it was just it was just like i explained in the video it was well, just one syllable and it was it could have been crowley's voice i don't know anyway i'm going to tell you a little bit more about the background which will make you understand why um, it's it may be relevant that it's that I'm doing this on a Saturday instead of any other day now that St. Friday's wise. It it could be a, an opportunity that won't come again for many years when the nineteenth of October falls on a Saturday. But the background for this whole thing, um, including Ellis's own expedition, which I talk about in the in last year's film in the clips I showed you, is this book here. It is called 21st Century Grail, The Quest for a Legend by Andrew Collins. It is by Virgin Books and it was published in 2004. What it does is it tells the story, as the name suggests, <coughs> it tells the story of Andrew Collins. This is Andrew Collins here. Um, his quest to find the Holy Grail. He was sent on a, on a quest, basically by some spirits, to find 
the Holy Grail it is still around it's in this country it is available and it's all part of what I'm, I'm doing this evening and what I did last year although I didn't actually have a copy of the book last year I have got one now now it, could, it refers to what happened to him when he did what I'm about to do and he did this in 2002 I'll just read you I'll just read you some of the relevant sections of the book <clears throat> right All of us were quite astounded by the level of accuracy of the psychic information that evening, especially as St. Frideswide had said, soon will be the time of my calling. Everything seemed to be going right, and hopefully we were now in with a chance of finding a physical key to unlock the truth of the Grail when we finally reached Binzi on her feast day. So here we go, he's talking about here. Back at Leon C, I got online immediately and checked out the Feast of St. Frideswide as Sue and Richard stood behind me. It was 19th of October, just over three weeks away. It could not have been timed better unless it happened to fall, unless it happened to fall on a Saturday. I looked at my calendar and saw the 19th was indeed a Saturday. Okay, that's, um, that's actually the Saturday, the 19th of October 2002, right? It was a Saturday... As it is today, in fact, today to, is the year 2013, the 19th of October, also falls on a Saturday. It's the only time it's fallen on a Saturday since 2002, and what's more, it, um, the 19th of October will not fall on a Saturday again until 2019. So basically, if um, I don't do what I'm supposed to do tonight, I, will, I may not get another chance for seven years. Sorry, six years. Here we go. Saturday the 19th of October. Delays on the road meant we did not reach Oxford until around 3.30pm. <clears throat> Before going out to Binzi, we first paid our respects to St. Frideswide's 13th century stone shrine in Christchurch Cathedral, which we entered shortly before the building closed. It was when I saw this magnificent monument destroyed at the time of the Reformation in the mid-16th century and then repaired, jigsaw style, in Victorian times, that something struck me as greatly significant between the arches supporting the roof of the tomb with three faces peering out of the foliage and he talked he describes the various symbols he, um, Andrew described various symbols that he's come across in the course of his journey um, Andrew Collins I should say is a very very interesting guy this is him he um, he writes an awful lot about Egypt today and um, our ancient archaeology he's been doing a lot of Egyptology but he's He's, he studies all kinds of um, mysterious alternative thought. He's, he's a leading thinker in all those things. Anyway, back to the story. They, they, had, they do a meditation at the shrine and um, talk about um, various, things, various things associated with St. Frideswide that are in the book, which I can't go into detail, but it's all about the, the, very, the expedition they were on related to the, what was going on in the book. And this is where Alistair Crowley comes into it, because Alistair Crowley is one of the spirits that Collins contacted and was contacted by in the course of his quest. Alistair Crowley of course was the famous English magician and occultist and um, he was uh, he's uh, probably the most famous one of all. Mm. Leaving behind the decorated shrine we stopped to pay our respects to the stone floor slab in the chancel that covered St. Frideswide's earthly remains. A red nightlight had been placed at each of the four corners and all but one of them had now burned out. While placed on the gravestone's carved inscription was a bunch of yellow flowers. All this indicates that someone at least knew it was her feast day. And here we have a picture actually of Andrew. Here we have some pictures here of Andrew. Uh, with several people, this and Richard, Richard, one of his friends, Sue, his wife, standing next to St. Frideswide's tomb. And um, this is the St. Frideswide's here in the stained glass window in Oxford in Christchurch and well I'm not going to be going I'm not going to have time to go there this evening I'm not going to have time to go there this afternoon but um, I did pay a visit to St Frideswide Shrine a few days ago and I'll just sh show you that now St Frideswide window beautiful the shrine <coughs>
Been a few years since I did that. That's beautiful. Shrine again. This is the Lady Chapel. This is all scenes from St. Fry's Wide Life. The story continues. From Christchurch, Oxford, we continued to Binsey Church, which, ha which held a few surprises of its own. And I've shown you Binsey Church. In fact, um, if you look at the link, if you look in the um, last year's film, which I'll put as a link in the description box, you'll see that um, I actually include a link to the film I originally made in Binsey in when I was when I was doing basically a case, I was casing the joint a few months earlier during daytime, during daylight hours, and um, you'll see that in there. Um, and he talks about, the, he describes the church in great detail um, and carries out a ritual to try and contact the spirit he wants to contact. And it's very, very interesting is that, um, I should show you where St. Fry's Wise Church is. I mean, I have shown you this before in the background videos, but I'll just show you again. Um, it's a really, really remarkable location because as you'll see from the video, it's, it's like a little village, it's like a tiny little village and it's so well preserved. Right, this is this is Oxford on the map. Okay, I can't soon if you can see the whole thing. That's Oxford there. Okay, and um, Oxford, of course, is this um, ancient university city here. This is Port Meadow. This large area. This is the largest piece of unploughed land in England. And um, there's Binsey. You see Binsey, that little village. As I explained, that's Binsey. There has the atmosphere of a tiny little hamlet, a tiny little village in the middle of the countryside and it's so well preserved it is virtually unchanged for over 300 years if you took away the plastic wheelie bins and the modern cars it would be like stepping backwards in time 300 years to step into this little village here it's just off the Thames path here that runs just up here this is the River Thames or the Isis as we call it which runs through Port Meadow again if you look at the background video you look at the background video in the link and, I'll, and you'll be able to see what I mean um, there's a pub there called The Perch, which I'll be heading to to meet my companion for this evening, as I did last year. Um, it's a different companion, as I said. I'm not sure if he wants me to name him. We'll soon find out. And it, we've got this little road here, and there's the church there. There's, the, there's a few little farmhouses, and there's the church, that little tiny cross there, see? That's the church with the well. Now, um, it's an amazing thing, because despite the, its feeling of being a remote little village, it's barely, it's barely an hour's walk from central Oxford. In fact, I'm going to be walking there this evening to get to it. And that's um, really quite, uh, quite amazing, amazing little place. And as you see, the church is completely unspoiled. It has, it's, compl it's, been, it's not been touched, the church. It's completely untouched. It doesn't even have electricity. It doesn't have running water. It doesn't have anything. Right, so I'll return to the story now. Having gained our composure inside the church, the three of us stepped outside into the diminishing light and sat beneath a large tree in the middle of the churchyard. After visualising the building as a single pigsty in wattle, this is to do, this is to do with the legends of St. Fry's Wide. Um, so we carry on here. It's all about finding a key. This is the point. They, they have to try and find this key. It's, a very, it's, a long, it's difficult to explain. You need to read the book. It's well worth reading. It really is. <clears throat> but... Um, what happens next yes um yes indeed they go they hang around there during the day they're going around there just at dusk time to just see what it's like a bit like what i did and then they come back later 
After driving around the dark for half an hour or so, attempting to find an Indian restaurant, <laughs> I know the feeling, we went back to the Perch Inn in Binzi, in Binzi Lane, that's in the actual village of Binzi, and ordered drinks and an evening meal there. It was lucky we arrived when we did, for only 15 minutes later, the bar staff were rushed off their feet when a group of around 20 to 30 people unexpectedly descended on the place. Well, I hope that doesn't happen to me this evening. Anyway, um, it is, it's important what happens later. Walking out of the pub into the pitch black somehow felt significant on this of all nights, particularly as we seem to be so far away from the city of Oxford, even though it was just three kilometres, two miles, as the crow flies, as I said, as you saw on the map there. Um, we made the decision to leave the car parked at a suitable spot halfway down the track leading to the church and walk the rest of the way so as not to alert the residents of the two small farmhouses located just behind the churchyard. Yes, indeed. Um, that's a pro I think the problem last year was Jeff was going around um, taking photographs and things like that. <laughs> I, I, hadn't gathered, I hadn't sort of intended that he should, That's not what we really went there for. And I did worry about Jeff disturbing the, the, the residents. Um, he continues, right. Um, yeah. Over and above this consideration was Richard's growing anxiety caused by his belief that everything might not go the way we had planned it. He was not sure why, but had a sneaking suspicion that the faceless ones would put in an appearance, since they wanted to prove something to us. We reached the church at around 9.15pm, and rest, resisting the temptation to see whether the church was open, we made straight for the Holy Well. After a brief few minutes to gain our composure and focus on the matter in hand, the meditation got underway with Sue seated on the lowest step. Me on another halfway up, and Richard sitting on the uppermost one. Now, the well at Binsey Church is famous because it's it's this well that was supposedly found by St. Fry's Wide, as I explained in the introductory video from last year. And it is the basis of the treacle well in, um, in um, Lewis Carroll's famous Alice in Wonderland fantasy story. Carroll, of course, was a local writer. who He often visited this church and the well. Um... Where we are. As Crowley had suggested, we visualised ourselves sinking down into the round cauldron-like basin of dark water beneath the miniature arch, which now became our gateway into another realm. Each person visualised themselves standing on the edge of a precipice, calling out to their own spiritual guardians for guidance and protection. Thereafter, we saw ourselves jumping together into the abyss and our unconscious minds embracing the void wishing only to learn the truth that lay on the other side, where light would once more be restored. We found ourselves perpetually falling into the blackness, and occasionally weird creatures manifested before us, and strange scenes formed momentarily before evaporating into nothing. The whole process continued for around ten minutes, as we pushed ourselves ever onward until we finally glimpsed the light of the grail. I, thought I saw three spoked Triskelion once more. That's a symbol with three legs in a circle. It's basically it's, it's um, the emblem of the Isle of Man, and it's on the flag. Spinning faster and faster until it transformed into three female heads, the symbol of Ellen, enshrouded by brilliant, da dazzling brilliance. They grew into three beautiful women, grail maidens, dressed in white, and each held a chalice made of a different metal. One gold, one silver, one copper. From different directions, they gracefully came together to form one single being, who held the Marian chalice, which transformed into pure light, reaching out at the rays of the cross. Into this brilliance now descended a dove, a feminine symbol of the descent of the divine into corporeal existence, similar, symbolised by the bitter cup, as well as Mary's alabastron, <coughs> the cup of the Last Supper, the Holy Grail, and most importantly, the communion cup of the Paschal Vigil, where the Holy Spirit was experienced by those who drank from its contents after undergoing the rite of baptism. This is what the well signified. It was not just a place of ritual cleansing, like the church front at Newfield. Nuffield. Nuffield. It, its curious inscription being a clue to this end, similar to the other sacred centres, such as Headcorn and Bourges, the well existed as an access point to the divine light through an imaginary cosmic axis linking heaven, earth and the underworld. Seen at Binzi by some as the pit of revelations. Blimey, what am I getting myself involved in? Where kings of the world, rulers of time, once sat in majesty controlling their dominions, so long as they remained pure conduits of the divine. This, then, was the other aspect of that perennial question. To whom serves the grail? 
When the king, the land and the light came together as one, the world axis turns and life thrives in that realm. When they are not in harmony and the, and the king falters, then the country becomes susceptible to plagues, invasions and other maladies symbolised by the fighting dragons in the story of Llyd and Llyvelis and the wasteland and lame king of the Grail romances. In the case of the Grail, contact with the divine is generally twelvefold, sometimes sevenfold or even threefold. It's like the spokes of an enormous wheel controlling the passage of time, with the axle existing beyond time itself. Whether Christian, Gnostic, Cathar, Templan, Templar, Jonanine or anyone else, the source of the Grail relates to the containment in physical or bodily form of the divine, the one and all expressed as the light of God. In Christianity the divine light is seen as grace, the Holy Spirit, and the tongues of fire which descend on the apostles at Pentecost, their baptism of fire. Yet in, the Jewish, in Jewish mysticism it is the feminine and sexually orientated Shekinah, or the presence of God. That best expresses the divine light, like Babylon, Ellen, Sophia, Venus. The Shekinah is the earthly gateway to the divine, and through her all must pass to reach heaven. In Hindu tantric belief she is Shaku, the primordial female energy whose union with Shiva enables humankind to ascend and find oneness with the divine. Yet in reality, it is a universal cosmic power source, invariably connected with female sexual energy and exalted by humanity since the goddess cults of Paleolithic and Neolithic times. Once chosen women, priestesses, would sit at the dead centre of their realms on stone thrones and channel this divine light outwards to bring fecundity to the land. Now isn't that like the story of St. Friedwig, who brings water out of the ground? In this place, which is which is, as the book explains as well, the, the area, Binsey, Oxford, is almost like the centre of the country. Um, it's, the, it's the borderland between many, many kingdoms, both in, in Iron Age Celtic times and in Anglo-Saxon times. Back to the story. Um, as well as divine revelation in the individual on contact with the One, the All, the Srima, Divine Mothers of India, still bear some knowledge of this channeling, this divine light, even today. Moreover, it is an intelligent force still expressed in Western culture through the continued presence of the Faceless Ones, the Order of Melchizedek and the Grail Maidens, personifications of Elen as the light of the land, which exists as part of the necessary apparatus preserving the truth of the Grail. Fascinating stuff. What happens next? The Hooded Figures. Unexpectedly, everything began to shift in the churchyard as a wind squall made the trees hiss loudly, and Richard broke out of the meditation, complaining that he felt sick and dizzy. Each of us then clearly heard the sound of someone lifting the metal hatch on the gate, the metal latch of the gate in the, the churchyard, breaking out our train of thought. Breaking our train of thought. I told Sue and Richard to ignore it. It was probably just someone out walking their dog. We fell silent for a moment or two before we saw a very disturbing sight indeed. Out of the darkness emerged a long line of cowled figures, quite human on this occasion, who moved at a steady pace along the path towards the church's south entrance. They were at right angles to our line of vision, as they came within six metres, twenty feet, of where we were staring in disbelief. More than this, I could hear their voices in the breeze and realised they were chanting in Latin. There seemed to be around twelve of them, and from the manner of their walk, I quickly concluded that they were probably all male. Where the hell had they come from? They had not, they had not been in the pub, and had arrived on foot in total darkness with a torch between them. Fright and a strange rationalisation of the situation now overwhelmed me. For the moment, who exactly they were did not matter. However, as they appeared to be directing their attentions towards the church, which we presumed was still open, they could not have spotted us yet. Once they disappeared inside the building, then hopefully we would be occupied in there long enough for us to complete what we were here to do. I started to feel something happening just before their arrival. Richard now revealed, at the last, as, as the last of the cowled figures disappeared from view inside the church, I can sense Crowley right behind me now. I think we should get out of here, Sue said, fearing for our safety. I really don't think we should stay here. We don't know who they are and they might not take too kindly to us messing up their evening. As slow minutes ticked by, and we could now hear Latin chanting coming from inside the darkened interior of the church, I tried to convince her that we were safe. There was nothing to worry about, and everything was under control. 
By now, Richard was focusing his mind on the presence standing behind him. Crowley's using this energy to manifest the key. Suddenly, everything changed. I just saw a flash, Richard exclaimed, excited. I just saw a flash, Richard exclaimed, excitedly. Where exactly? Over by that wall. He turned his head around and nodded to the west end of the church. I thought I saw a flash as well, Sue broke in, looking in the same direction. It was definitely over by the wall. It's the key, Richard hesitatingly announced. He's standing, pointing down. Go there now, go. The three of us moved steadily across the base of the wall, and as I began to illuminate the spot with a small torch, Richard searched beneath the thick mat of green chicory that encroached the concrete runoff at the base of the wall. Still, the sound of Latin chanting could be heard emanating from the window above our heads. We had to move fast, as they might re-enter the churchyard at any time. The torch is reflecting off the window, Sue suddenly exclaimed. They can see it! Perhaps we had already given away our presence. Perhaps it was too late. But there was no way that we were going to give up now. Might be further across, across to the right, Richard suggested, not too certain himself. Knowing the failure rate of our artif artifact retrieval, I was not banking on anything. Still, I sat down on the wet grass and shielded the light from the torch to allow a bright orange glow to hit the area in question. Richard tugged hard at another clump of chickweed, realising its fine white roots, releasing its fine white roots from the earth, as I unexpectedly saw something metallic come into view. Oh my god! Oh my god! It was an ornate metal key with a heavily oxidised patina, indicating both its age and the fact that it had been out in the open for some time. Um, that means it's rusted, basically. Get it! Richard picked it up and we instantly rose to our feet. Go now! Run! Without a further word, we ran as fast as we could to get past the south entrance and then across the churchyard towards the exit gate. I never looked back, but Richard did, noting that there was no light whatsoever coming from the interior of the church now, making the presence of these people seem almost ethereal in nature, and causing Sue to later question whether or not the phys figures were physically real. Now that's interesting, because that's the question I asked. That's why I dressed up in all that makeup in case they were real. <clears throat> As we came within a few metres of the gates, Sue stumbled over a jutting piece of curbstone and fell awkwardly, spraining her ankle. Sue, get up! I yelled in frustration, as both Richard and I lifted her to her feet and carried her out of the churchyard. Despite the pain, she now began to laugh uncontrollably at what had happened. This is just unbelievable, she cried, shaking her head. What the hell happened to us? Richard slowly came to a halt, allowing us all to catch our breath. Do you think we should go back there? He suggested, in all seriousness. It's the only way we're going to find out what's going on. I mean, who exactly are they? His suggestion was not greeted too kindly. We just needed to get away from there as quickly as possible. Sure. So, sorry, Sue felt they were representative of, representative of the faceless ones. Well, I did tell you. Uh, I thought we, we, they wanted to try to prove something to us here tonight. He responded in an I told you so voice. And I am now convinced that this did not just mean finding the key. Once more, each of us questioned where the men in the church had come from, or what they had been doing chanting Latin in the darkness. OK, they might, they might have just been students from Christchurch coming here for a little choir practice. If this was the case, their timing was impeccable and probably resulted in us finding the key. However, there was a definite sense that something was not right and that they would not have taken kindly to our presence here. As it turned out, we were right to act the way we did, for when a week or so later I spoke to the rector of the church, the Reverend Robert Sweeney, he admitted having no knowledge whatsoever of any service, choir practice or function that had gone on in St Margaret's Church on the feast day of St Frideswide. Indeed, when I told him what had been seen, he was initially lost for words and he said it was not official. Somewhat of an understatement, in my opinion. Hmm. Well, it could have been. It's possible there's some kind of college fraternity that carries out rituals on the feast of St Frideswide. Um, maybe just when it happens on a Saturday which is why today is so important, because it's the first Saturday since this experience that they're writing about took place. He goes on to talk about many, many, he goes on to talk about many, many other things here, unorthodox religious groups. Then the story continues. Still, we half ran, half walked back to where the car had been left, helping Sue where necessary. We jumped inside and sped off into the night, glancing behind us at the large, a large four-wheel drive vehicle that seemed to appear out of nowhere. We did not feel totally safe until we were back on the Oxford Road, heading into the city once more. I'll show you where that is. Okay. It's, it's at 
it's that road there. All right, leads from Binzi back into the city proper. It's the actual only road between that you can actually want to drive to Binzi. It's the only one that goes there. So it must have been the one that they used. Um, my brain was so fired up that I got completely lost trying to navigate the awkward one-way system and ended up going round in circles for half an hour or more. We did eventually settle down in a pub, the Plasterer's Arms. Well, that's odd because the Plasterer's Arms is right over here in in an old Marston. It's well, it's up here in in in, old, in the old Marston area. No, no, it's I saw it's in the quarry area. It's, it's somewhere up here in the quarry area around Risinghurst, New Hennington, that area. I can't remember where exactly. I used to go in there. Um, which is full of local men watching a Saturday night football on television. That's odd. Maybe they had missing time because they got to the pub at 9.15 or something and went to have this experience and they came all the way back. Blind me. Oh, there's all kinds of things happen to them here. I'll, I'll just carry on with the story in a minute. Um, leaving the pub at closing time, we found a grotty bed and breakfast of the kind, sadly reserved for students and foreign tourists, and spent a few hours just holding the key and using psychometry in an attempt to learn something about its history. Only flashes of future and past came. Seven churches in Rome, underground catacombs, the Order of the Apocalypse, a castle aligned to the sun, the Chateau of Arc, that's, that's in the Chateau of Arc, that's in the Holy Grail country, and a horse and cart departing, Oh yeah, like round Renle Chateau I'm talking about, that area. A horse and cart departing from a large fortified medieval citadel in the heart of the French Languedoc. In the front seat were two monks dressed in simple brown hoods. Once they are out of range of prying eyes and the king's guard, one of them reached behind and pulled away a sackcloth covering to reveal the presence of the head of God, the two-faced head requi reliquary previously in the hands of the Knights Templar and smuggled out of England with the help of the White Cannons. Realising that their dangerous mission was almost over, and that the priceless relic was now safe, the two men turned to each other and smiled knowingly as they continued the journey unhindered towards their final des destination. And that's almost the end of the book. So, um, that's what Andrew Collins experienced now. But, the, but he is not the only one. He and his team are not the only people to experience something strange at that church in Binsey on the Feast of St. Frideswide. Okay, I'm just going to read you a description now of somebody who has also had a similar experience to Andrew Collins and his team on another occasion at St Margaret's Church in Binsey. I'm not sure if this person wants me to actually name who they are, so I'm not going to actually name the individual I'm talking about here. But um, these, this, is what the base, this is what he basically says. <clears throat> um, he's a friend of mine, good friend of mine, and he's in, he is involved in similar kind of kinds of research to Andrew Collins. One day a friend contacted me to tell me how he was reading Andrew Collins' book, 21st Century Grail, which you've just seen. And in it, Andrew reports a tr on a trip to St Margaret's Church, Binsey, following psychic clues whereupon he and his companions had found what they what they'd been looking for, an engraved key. They had been told by the spirit of Alistair Crowley, no less, to be there before midnight on St Fried's Wise Day, <coughs> the 19th of October. While fossicking around looking for the key, they were alarmed to to witness twelve hooded figures moving through the churchyard in procession, chanting slowly in Latin, before they entered the church to presumably conduct a ceremony. Collins and co. didn't hang around to find out. That's the story I've just read you. Very soon it would be the Feast of St Frideswides again, and so my friend, another friend and I, resolved to check this out. The moon was bright that night. We scampered back into the shadows of the trees and waited for what might happen. It was ten to midnight. A famous film of Charles Bronson, of course, as well. It's a good one, that. Two of us were together at the rear of the churchyard, while the other was a little in front of us. <coughs> as we wasted, I could see misty shapes rising from some of the graves, and then, quick as a flash, I saw a cloaked figure dash from the undergrowth, about ten yards to my right. My companion saw it too, and we both kept gazing through the shadows, trying to see where it had gone. Then my other friend whispered, They're here. A group of four or five dark cloaked and hooded figures walked slowly through the eerie glow of the moon and silently along the path to the church door and entered. Almost at once we could see the flicker of candlelight reflecting on the window and straining to hear the barely audible incantations within. 
We crept up to the walls of the church, but because the windows were too high, we could not see what was going on. The candle lights flickered and glowed in the dark interior, and the low mumble of the Latin chanting continued. Once or twice we thought we heard movement inside by the door, and scampered back to the bushes, but nobody appeared. Nor, not till the ritual was over anyway. Fortunately we weren't by the door. The figures came out and exited the yard in the same manner as we as they had entered it. We were sure that not everyone had left the church and waited a couple of minutes before following the clandestine group to see where they went. But when we did, there was no trace of them. There was, they were nowhere to be seen. It was as if they'd never been there. Isn't that strange? So that's another person I know who's had a similar experience there. I'm a third person. Well, well not the third, because he had some people with him, but I'm the third expedition to ex experience something strange. Nothing as spectacular as that, but that strange voice in my ear. And now tonight, let's see what happens. This may be another, this may be the fourth occasion. Right, so um, <clears throat> it's now coming up to ten to five. I'm going to have to head off because I've um, got to get ready, get, get ready to go and um, head up towards Port Meadow. I'm going to walk across Port Meadow again to Binsey and um, to meet my companion at the pub which from then from there we're going to go to the church and explore so i hope you'll join me there see you there well, hospital porters pride and dignity stop the new world order welcome to hapanwo tv right so i've uh, i'm on port meadow and i've just uh, moved a short distance from the car park and uh, i've I, pause for a moment to let my eyes adjust to the dark but i don't think it's actually going to be necessary because um it's really really quite amazing we've got a now i'm not using the low light camera i'm not using the low light yet because of um the battery but i can tell you right now that we've got a bright full moon there you see huge bright big full moon and you may actually be able to see me without the low light, so without the low light on. Isn't that beautiful? The sky's almost completely clear. There's a small amount of clouds to the north. Um, the weather, the forecast is for, well, it's even better than the forecast said, actually. The forecast is says for, for short, squally showers, apart from that, fine and dry. So the weather is extremely different to how it was when I was last here. It's a good deal warmer than the last time I was here too. It's actually pretty mild, I've got my jacket undone. I don't know, you can probably see me actually in the, in the light of the full moon without the low light. I don't know how good my camera is at picking that up. It's perfect sky watching weather if I wasn't ghost watching, I'll tell you. Um, now, where I am on the map, you can see from the, um, I've just moved a short distance from the car park. Um, I don't know if you follow me on Google Earth, but if you go to Google, oh, I don't know how to explain it to you, actually. <laughs> I'm at the southern end of Port Meadow. You'll see at the southern end of Port Meadow, there's a road called Walton Well Lane, a Walton Well Road leading to a car park and the southern end of Port Meadow. And that's where I am. It's quite busy, actually. A cyclist has just come past me. There's a couple of pedestrians around. Oxford City is actually pretty busy tonight. And there's loads of drunk students going around in um, mortarboards and gowns. I think they've just graduated or they've just had exams. I walked past a couple of places where they were queuing up for balls. Uh, it's a common thing in Oxford. I don't when the Bullingdon Club go out and about. Mm. I'm just gonna... I think it's... Uh, I feel a lot more, as I said, a lot more secure than the last time I came here. I don't think there's gonna be trouble from any people, right? put it that way. Mm. It's now 9pm and I've got an hour to get to the perch at Binsey, so... Um, I'm going to just walk up river. Just, I'm going to follow the same route I did on the last video. The best way is actually to follow me on the last video and um, use the last video to, to trace the route I went from last year. Although it was pissing down with rain, freezing cold then. Tonight it's bright, moonlit and warm. There's stars everywhere. Um, the funny thing is, in Andrew Collins' book, he said it was a full moon when he was there. Well, now... The, the moon's actually, it's, it's actually one day past full. Um, it's, it's almost full. Very wide, it's a very wide waning gibbous moon. Just one day, just one day past full, so. 
That's interesting. I wonder if it's the same phase that when Collins and his crew came here back in 2002. Are they, what are, is whatever they saw going to put an appearance after 13 years of silence? Well, not silence, actually, no, because what am I saying? A friend of mine saw it before. I heard it last time I was here last year. I think someone wants to communicate with me, certainly with us. Let's see what happens. I'm going to head to the perch now. I'm meeting my companion there, and um, I'll have a few drinks while I'm in there, and um, see if I pick up any human intelligence like I did at Peasmore last week. See you in a bit. Well, I've come a little way now from Port Meadow. I'm now in uh, <coughs> on the I'm now on Fiddler's Island. If you check that out on the map, Fiddler's, Fiddler's Island is on the left-hand part of the of the uh, southern end of Port Meadow. I've walked along the footpath from the Walter and Well Lane, and I'm now on Fiddler's Island. There's the marina over there, and I'm sure you can see an awful lot. I know you can see me through my you can see me now from um, in the full moonlight. And there's a party going on over there. There's someone's hired a boat. And you can see cavorting students having the time of their lives in there. If I can focus it. I can't, hand won't focus, but uh, it, it's one of the university barges. They hire them out to students. As I said, this is a, a big sort of... Um, student partying night obviously because it must be the end of exams or maybe it's the they graduate or something i don't know the lives of students are a mystery to me even for someone coming from oxford um but looks like having the time of their lives on that boat just over the river um i feel a lot more relaxed than i did last time i was here an awful lot more relaxed um as i said the last time i was here do you remember it was wet, it was windy, there was hardly anyone around. It was cold. And I'm walking on Fiddler's Island now, feeling a lot more secure, knowing this bridge, the Rainbow Bridge, will be open. <clears throat> now, at the north end of Fiddler's Island, there's a bridge. It's a, it's a huge arch, a single arch bridge leading over to the Thames Path on the, on the right bank of the Isis, or Thames, the western bank, that is. And, um, I was, when, I, when I came here last time, I was worried it might be shot by the police or something because they wanted to keep people away from the whatever ceremony was going on from whatever secret student or, or uh, Illuminati secret society that exists in Oxford. And there's a lot of them, I'll tell you. As I've explained many times, Oxford is the heartland of Illuminati education. I mean, a lot of these drunkards I've been passing <laughs> are going to probably be put in positions of power and in corporations, in the military, in government in the next few years. But, um, it all looks very, very peaceful. There's a residential boat there. And as I said, it's beautiful. I can't help the feeling I'm being watched. Maybe it's just me being paranoid. Well, I'm not paranoid, am I? Of course not. But, I don't know, I heard the gate go at the far end by the car park just before I was, just while I was filming the last shot. And I didn't see anyone go past. It's almost like I feel like I'm being followed. I think maybe I'm... I shouldn't get that sort of worried about it really, I shouldn't get that concerned but you know me I'm a conspiracy theorist after all and every self suspecting conspiracy theorist has a touch of paranoia so uh, I'm going to cross the bridge now here's the bridge, Could hope you can see it I'm going to put the uh, low light on, I don't know if you can now you can see it there you are, see, that's the uh, top of the bridge. The low light doesn't have a very long range, so I'm not going to keep it on, but I'll go across the bridge now. And you can see that, look at that, that's light from the marina as well as the moon. There's the marina there, there's, a, there's that floodlight there, there's the party boat over there, and this is Fiddler's Island there, and there's the full moon. So, so far so good. I am, this bridge is not shut, the police I've not closed it because I know after last year, it's unlikely any people are involved in this. It's more a kind of, it's more a haunting type thing, a more a ghost investigation type thing rather than a breaching some kind of Bohemian Grove style secret society in Oxford. Right, I'm nearly at the end of the, but I've got to watch my foot, his foot in here. Although last year, these planks were as slippery as anything. These, these, floor, these boards and the bridge deck were slippery as anything. 
and I've crossed the bridge. Okay, I'm gonna carry on up. To, I'm gonna carry on upstream now to the Perch Pub in Binsey. See you then. I hope you can see as much of this view as I can. Um, I'm not switching the camera on and filming now for any particular reason, other than it's just beautiful here in the moonlight, this spot by the river. I can see the river down there. There's the moon. I can see the moon reflected in the river. There's the moon there. There's the moon reflected in the river. You probably can't see as much of this as I can. This camera's not good enough. We need Win Keach here with all these gadgets. Um, this is just a kind of slaxer noir, I suppose you would call this. The kind of thing slaxer would do in the dark, in the, in the night, night time. I just wanted to show that, at least share this with you, even if you can't see it. Those lights over there. That's a place called a Wolvercut. That glow above the horizon, I think, is the is the Cutslow roundabout at the top of the bypass. In that direction, there's a city of Oxford. Oh man, you could not wish for better weather tonight. You really couldn't. I'll keep an eye. I'll keep an eye out for the for the famous Oxford's famous floating restaurant. We've got a floating restaurant here. Which, some ducks over there, which is called Rosamond the Fair, and it's, in, it's on a narrow boat. You book in advance for your seat, and they cook your meals, and they, they do a cruise around the river. It's just a little narrow boat, very small and pokey, but um, very, very, very nice. So it's called Rosamond the Fair. It's named after somebody, actually. It's funny, Rosamond the Fair is actually um, a lady who's quite similar to St. Frideswide in, 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 Fried's in many ways. Um, Rosamond the Fair actually, although she actually, the geese going crazy. Mm. Rosamond the Fair, Rosamond the Fair lived about 700 years after St. Fried's Wide. However, they have a lot in common. They both lived in this area. How do I get through this? And um, so I've got a gate here to go through. Um, Rosamond was a was actually a nun at the convent up in Wolvercut, which, which I filmed that before, the ruined convent, and um, she was the she was a kind of a consort or the bit on the side for King Henry the Second, and um, there's rumoured to be an underground chamber there where they used to meet for their little noodling sessions, and um, being a nun in those days didn't mean you couldn't get your leg over occasionally, and if you were a king, of course, it was no problem. Uh, but there's a lot of uh, legends associated with Rosamond the Fair as well as St. Frideswides here in Oxford. Right, just wanted to show you that. Right, Binsey's over there. Can you see it? That there is Binsey. I'm a little bit early actually. I'm not meeting my companion for another how long? What's the time? Uh, I'm not going to meet him for another 40 minutes or so. I'm, I might go in a bit early, but I'm going to have a little 20 minute walk up the river. Right, um, I'll come back to Binsey in a little while. See ya. Right, those lights over there are the Perch. The Perch Inn. Or well, just the Perch. It's the pub. You can't see it very well. Um, I'm going to go in there and meet my companion, and then we're going to head off to the church. It's now coming close to 10 o'clock. I've had a lovely walk up the river. It's unbelievable. It's like, it's magical. It's just kind of, it's kind of Philip Pullman-y, if you've ever read the Dark Materials trilogy by Philip Pullman. It's that kind of magical feel in the air. It's so warm, I've got my jacket open and everything. And that's Binsey over there, lovely old ancient village. Just a short walk from Oxford. I'll talk later. Hospital Port has pride and dignity. Stop the New World Order. Welcome to Hapanwo TV. I just left the pub. I had a drink in the pub. I met up with my companion. I can now reveal to you it's none other than Ellis Taylor, <laughs> who you're all familiar with. Um, we're going to head up to the church now. We're on the road from between Binsey and the church. Which is a, it's about half a mile. It's not far. And there's no lights. There's no artificial lights. But the moon is still shining, although it's been covered by a chemtrail. Um, still beautiful, bright... Uh, very bright, very mild night. 
totally, you couldn't imagine more different weather. It looks, it feels very magical. It's rather Philip Pullman-y, as I was saying. Makes me think of the Egyptians and demons and things it's like that. Beautiful. It's a beautiful evening in it, Al. Yeah, just lovely. You know. Over to our left, then, is where there used to be the village of Seacourt. I've, yeah, I've, yeah Seacourt was a well-known name no around more. Oxford. There used to be a mm. there, quite a big village. Mm. That's well, gone. Like so much in the countryside, is, is emptied over the years. The plague and the industrial level revolution has taken their toll. That's it. Which means cities have filled up and the countryside is emptied. That's it. And, um, um, over on our right is Port Meadow, and almost directly opposite is where is um, an ancient barrow. That's right. The, the tumulus in the middle of the in the middle of the meadow. That's it. I was explaining to the, to the viewers earlier that Port Meadow is actually the largest piece of unplowed, unplowed land in England. It's a wonderful place. It's huge, it's yeah. And, and, uh, and this road, then, mm. actually comes to a stop at the church and apparently always has done. Now, what's mm. really strange is that just one field over is the road to the next village, which is Whiteham. That's true, isn't it? Now, there's no... This road has never gone all the way to Whiteham. You think so someone... Why is mm. that? I well, yeah. a bypass in between now, but even before then there was no road yeah. all the way through. Check out the video I showed you... Uh, check out the video earlier, the parts where I showed you the map. It's true. Yeah. Now, no-one in all the centuries has built a, a, a little path, even so much as a pathway between Binsey and the Whiteham Road, and that's really weird. It makes, makes you wonder what's in between that they didn't want to cross. Yes. Now, we are talking a little bit Wicker Man stuff here because this is a very esoteric area, as you know, and uh, mm. it's all owned by the colleges, etc. Yeah. Um, Christchurch owns Binsey Church. Yeah. And um, I don't know whether anybody's aware, but the only English Pope was actually a rector at this church. Really? Yeah. Oh, right. And that was Adrian IV. His real name was Nicholas Breakspear, and I think it was in the 12th century. Right. He was a rector here. Yeah. Just going to show how old this church is. I mean, I'm not going to film in the church tonight. I'm not going to actually even... I probably won't even film much in the graveyard, because you've seen it all on the film I did last year. Just refer yourself to that. I don't like to repeat myself on Hapanwo TV. Um, but uh, obviously I would record anything noteworthy if I possibly can. Although, when strange things occur, very often things like electronic devices like cameras tend not to work, so I'll do my best, OK? Yeah. Yeah. And we'll, we'll have to be very quiet and, uh, you know, just hope that something occurs yeah. and that we can catch it. I mean, the road we're on now, we just walk quite swiftly through the Binsey village and not try not to disturb anyone because the road we're on now only goes in one direction, it goes to that church only, and a couple of and a much newer farmhouses. But originally, it only went to the church and nowhere else. That's so, <clears throat> so uh, and that's Whiteham Woods up there. That is a very spooky place. It's a huge, great big hill covered in woods, and there's a sign. There's a sign. You can't. You can get up there, but you, there's a sign telling you not to, unless you actually. Because it's again, it's all university land. Like most of the land in Oxford, university. Yeah, it's university land. There was a crop circle up there a few years back. Oh, right. And um, there are some ancient um, sites up there as well, so mm. um, not very easily distinguished and, yeah. and, uh, and hidden. I can remember as a child we used to go to um, a place called, what was it called? Hill End Camp. Hill End Camp, of course, yeah. And they took us for walks around there, yeah. and I can remember them showing us a couple of places. Um, yeah. Oh, I used to go to Hill End Camp, and oddly enough, the, uh, the main building at Hill End Camp is called the Green Dragon. That's it, the Green Dragon and the Red Dragon. Yeah, isn't that odd? Was, yeah. Now, you can't see what we can see, of Hanwell TV viewers, and I wish you could, but this camera can't pick it up. We, we, this, is where, this is where we need Win Keach, and he's not here. <laughs> It's, um, we tried to, well, I tried to get hold of him, but hmm. I don't know if he's No, he's, uh, he's not available at the moment, unfortunately. But uh, over to our left is a huge hill, which is... You can see on the map to the west of Oxford, just northwest of Oxford, it's uh, a hill, very steep hill covered in woods. 
which is white and woods and I had a dream about white I had a dream about that place once that hill now this is oh. the long stretch that goes straight to the church yeah we're almost there and now when I saw the figures last time I came these, these monks we looked up here and there's no way they could have covered this distance in the time yeah that we got round to have a look yeah so either there's some kind of tunnel yeah. or they're not of this world they come in and out of this world, maybe through a stargate of some kind. Yeah, we're not sure what's, um, what's going we're gonna on. It's very peculiar that they could have just vanished like that. Because yeah. We looked everywhere, there was no, definitely no sound of any bikes or cars or anything like that. So. Mm. Ellis is the guy I was telling you about earlier. I didn't name him, but he doesn't mind me naming him now. He's the guy I told you about earlier who saw those strange things yeah. back then. I'm going to stop filming now, or as we go into the church, and we'll just sit ourselves, set, settle down, and then we'll check in again. See you in a bit. We've arrived at the churchyard. Don't know how much you can see. All right, I'm not, I'm not going to go out filming like I did last time. Um, as I said, look at the original video to, to see all the area I'm in. We're in the bushes where we were before last year with Jeff, but we're keeping very quiet. And we're just going to see what happens and we're not going to go into the church or churchyard at all unless something happens okay so um we're also going to have to keep our voices down all right so um see you later we found a place to sit now am i just going to sit here and wait there's ellis ellis is there and i'm here we've got all bases covered Everything's normal so far. No, it's not normal. Okay. Okay. We're just gonna have a, a look at the church. <coughs> I know I said I wouldn't, but it's only 25 past 11, we've got time. So bright in the moon. <sighs> There's this real spookiness about the place. <sighs> this is the famous well. St. Margaret's Church at Binsey. Andrew Collins and his team left a trail of acorns along here. We haven't done that. Foliage. Stand here and I'll see if I can see you. Okay. We think we found a better observation spot. But Ellis is just going to see if he can see me from here. Okay. okay. As long as we're in the shadow, in there, it will be all right. We'll be okay as long as we're in the shadow.
Oh, hospital ports, pride and dignity, stop the new world order. Welcome to Panwo TV. Well, I'm at my dad's house now. Um, I'm, I'm come here because I'm going to sleep on the settee. The reason I come here is um, I'm basically knackered. And my dad has super fast broadband so I can upload this film quicker. Um, basically, we, not a lot happened, I'm afraid, after the end of the last segment um, we basically stood around in the churchyard waiting for something to happen and nothing did um, it's a shame I didn't do any filming after because Ellis, Ellis wasn't really in the mood to film and neither was I I think we were both a bit disappointed especially after what happened last year um, I didn't hear any strange things I didn't see anything strange at all Ellis said he saw a couple of things that he thought were a bit odd and he said that the energy there felt flat um, but basically we saw absolutely nothing um, I guess that's how it goes you don't always um, whatever thing or whatever it was that tried to communicate with me last year couldn't or wouldn't this year um, if that's what happened I'm not sure I mean it definitely was something I heard something strange there's no doubt about it but whatever it was it didn't come back this year um, totally different atmosphere in the churchyard I mean as I said it's been lovely lovely um, um, beautiful uh, light I mean, when we walked out from under the bushes out of the shade it was like being in daylight I felt I almost needed sunglasses against the moon um, it could be that whatever Andrew Collins and Ellis and other people have been doing in that churchyard has changed the energy of the place and maybe this is why these strange apparitions no longer appear I don't know, I, mean, I don't know if I'll try next year, I'll have to see see how I feel, right now I'm just knackered and I've got to, I've got to um, go to bed soon because and I'll upload this while I'm sleeping because I'm just tired and I've got to get up early because I'm going to I'm going to the um, question everything group tomorrow I'll take this camera just in case something interesting happens there <laughs> anyway um, thank you for watching hospital ports pride and dignity stop the new world order